Hello and welcome to Freeze Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And today we've seen Diego Maradona. Is, it, is the film called Diego Maradona or Maradona? Um, I think the posters seem to have just Maradona, but the title on the BBFC you know, per, uh, 12A card was Diego Maradona. The title at the start of the film is Diego Maradona. And I think it's important because the film makes um, quite a point of Diego and Maradona being two parts of the same person. And actually, I... I thought that the film put it so wonderfully, you know, and actually something for people who work on stars to think about, because basically the film argues that, so Diego and Maradona are different, you know, but Maradona, the star persona, drags Diego, yeah, through through, life, through, yeah. through things that Diego himself might not have wanted to, I, you know, that the star persona exerts a pull and a push on the real person, whether they like it or not, yeah? Mm. That kind of, you know, they're not the same, they're distinct, but uh, uh, they're linked, obviously, they embody the same thing, yeah? But that the the image and the persona kind of uh, has a, a, different, um, a different pull. Yeah. yeah, in the film, that idea is introduced by one of the interviewees. You only hear them in voiceover. All the, all the, all the visuals are... TV and news and archival footage, mm-hmm. um, but the the voiceover uh, interviewee is Maradona's um, personal trainer, or fitness trainer at Napoli. Yes, and he's the one who says, "I'm happy to. I want Diego, not Maradona." Something like that. He's the one who introduces the idea of the difference between the two of them. Yeah. That the film then allows itself to kind of pick up on. Um, he says something like, "For Diego, you know, Diego is a wonderful person and lovely right. and kind, and you know, I do anything for Diego." You know, Maradona is a different story, yeah. right? Maradona, uh, is, uh, Maradona is the star. Maradona uh, is the version that can't can't show any. That's right. He says, he says Diego is a person with insecurities, a wonderful boy. Mm. Maradona can't show any insecurities, can't show any weakness. He's the version of of Diego Maradona that is shown to the public yes. and has to be strong and so on and so forth. And is a kind of monster, yeah. You know? Yeah, kind of kind of becomes that way, I suppose. Um, and also the the title. I think the way the title is actually shown on screen kind of is a slightly slight indication of that because it's Diego Maradona with a line between the two words, mm. you know, and it's kind of it's not something that you particularly pick up on. It's just like a sort of it's like a Final Cut Pro sort of template <laughs> title yeah. thing, but it's I think it is kind of communicating that in a way. There is a separation between Diego and Maradona, which is quite interesting. Uh, uh, and I suppose I should say, for the purpose of anyone who's seen it, this is a, a documentary made by Asif Kapadia, yes, um, who. Previously made Senna in 2010 about Ed and Senna, mm. the Brazilian um, uh, Formula One driver who lost his life in Italy in a crash. And in 2015, Amy, which is about Amy Winehouse. Did you end up seeing Amy? I watched Amy on Tuesday night after did we. After you told me I would love it. And did I you? hated it. Oh, I hate you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I really, uh, Why I, did you hate it? Well, yeah, I can go on about it if you want. I, I had... I had a really negative response to it. Why? Um, so, first thing is, I'd seen Senna before, and I didn't remember Senna all that well, and I didn't remember finding it that interesting, to be honest. It just hasn't really lingered long in the memory for me, so that's, you know, take it or leave it. Amy, to me, felt... Actually, I made one or two notes. Let me just, let me just quickly find, because... Uh... I lived in her albums for a period of three or four years. Yeah. They really spoke to me. I loved her. I loved her voice. I thought what happened to her was tragic. There are interesting similarities, actually, because you see the drugs destroy the person in Amy, and you see the drugs destroy the person in Maradona. Well, I, I the thing about Amy is it's about the media. The, I, the, there's a central difference between this, between Amy and Maradona, in that. Diego Maradona is alive to see this film we made. Naturally, he's been interviewed for it. Yes. Um, well, he seems to have been. It's not. You know. He has been. Yeah, I think um, he has been. Whereas Amy uh, Winehouse obviously had died, and the film but ends the with the father her death. was involved, wasn't he? Or the parents were involved in the making of the film. No, well, I think the thing was I did read something about the 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 dad. I think he'd been interviewed. He'd definitely been interviewed for it. But then when the film came out, um, he was unhappy with. An aspect, certain aspect well, he was unhappy portrayed, because and he went off and made something else. He was unhappy because he's shown 
Like, I, I mean, I think the reason why... What's the name of this director? Asif well, Kapadia. Asif Kapadia, where he's making such great documentaries, is that he shows the contradiction. So in Amy, you see, you know, the father is love, loves his daughter and is proud of her and whatever. And at the same time, he's also exploitative and exploiting of her. Right. You know? I think the film is exploitative, though, as well. I really had a problem with it. Oh. Because, and this is the thing about Amy herself not being alive for it, not being able to respond, not being able to have any control of it or anything like that. Control is maybe the wrong word, but any, any ability to respond, you know? Because um, it, it's a film that says the media is... It, it shows the media kind of hounding it. It basically shows this girl who had problems. She had significant problems, and she needed help. You know, it's rather like like um, like Britney Spears had the same thing in that was tw- twenty. I saw 2010, that, yeah. 2009 or something, when she was in a really bad way for a year. And kind of all the late night hosts were making jokes about it. She didn't rehab, out of rehab, all this, that and the other. And, and at some point you're going, this is beyond cruel. There's a point in Amy where they, they show a little bit that Gra- uh, Graham Norton on his show makes a joke about Amy Winehouse being a crazy person and just, the audience just laughs. And you're going, this is beyond cruel. But the film itself is indulging in it too. It's rubbernecking and it's exploitative and salacious and prurient and I really didn't like it and it's it's all built out of home footage a lot of it is built out of home footage um, particularly from when she's younger before I, she was famous obviously mm. and at some point I'm going why am I allowed to see this? Who because gets- because I remember seeing you know the tabloid covers showing you the um, the tweaks of the heroin needles in between her toes and that being front page Britain so actually, I don't think the film, you know, showed anywhere near, you know, what the tablets were showing every day for three years. I understand that, and I and I'm not I'm not like I don't want to absolve um, uh, the press for you know the way they behave towards or anything like that at all. I think it's disgusting, but I think it's just as disgusting to say, to to kind of put out this this uh, film that that says, you know, what the media was doing was horrible and she couldn't cope with it, but we're going to be just as invasive. If, he, well, if you really cared, you wouldn't have done it. No, no, but I, I think, hated it. I mean, I think it's because she's dead that you could then do this. Um, and I, I didn't feel it was invasive at all. Oh. I mean, what was invasive was the daily barrage of front page stories about her deterioration, which were like completely cruel and unfeeling, you know. But that had already happened, you know, b- before the film was made. So, and I think one has to deal with that. It is about the media. And actually, I think there's, there is an interesting similarity because this is also about, I don't know if it's about media, but it's about ideology, the, the Maradona film. It's only about relationship to the media. There's a very similar thing as to Amy in, in the way in which he cannot go out without mm. being hounded, without being kissed, without being covered by people, without the, the photographers and the microphones being all around him and that sort of thing. And his similar difficulties coping okay let's move on to talk about Maradona so what did you think of it okay uh, well, I liked it more um, <laughs> uh, partly for the reason I stated which is that you know if nothing else whatever happens there is a, a kind of a right to reply uh, implied by the fact that Maradona is alive um, but I liked it more because I think it's it's more substantial um, and I think it's you know, to, to a point, I don't get these films. Oh. I don't get these films where it's a focus on a person. It's like, well, I look at a troubled genius or something. I don't, I don't get it. And it and okay, well, I can elaborate on that because I don't think it's just on a person. I think the person is also kind of a metaphor and a really current one. I think it's a great, great film. Uh, and I think it's really a great film because, you know, it helps you understand how easily the crowd the rabble the the mob you know or or how a group of people can be turned into a mob right and the mob mentality and you know how kind of people are built into you know icons and they you know they signify on the one you know one minute they're god and the other minute they're literally the devil right and kind of and how that signified through it all and kind of you know the 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 individual kind of within that construct that's imposed by others i think kind of it's a really i think it's a really timely film yeah kind kind of particularly in a brexit moment where i think we're all being manipulated 
in the way that you see kind of all of the media manipulate things, you know, around national lines, uh, uh, you know, the feeding of the nationalist mob in Italy, right? Kind of that there's so many factors into it because, you know, there's the question of gender, there's the question of race that plays into it. There's divides between kind of North and South, right? There's the, there's the mafia's relationship to the government and each has an interest that exceeds that of the individual person you know and i think the film lays it out like absolutely clearly and demonstrates all the iconography around it i mean kind of you know people collecting the blood of you know stealing the blood of maradona so they could put it into a saint right mm. stuff like that i mean i think it's just extraordinary there's there's more of a kind of a structure and a kind of official structure to um the way in which Maradona's life is, is, is kind of made difficult and controlled than there, than there was in Amy. Um, th there is the, um, the mob, the um, uh, Camorra yes. crime family that runs Napoli, basically, um, that picks up on him and gets involved with him and then starts to control him essentially through cocaine mm. um, later on in his, in his career at Napoli in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, but there's also the boss of uh, Napoli, the president, who, you know, there's a pivotal moment uh, towards uh, it's about eighty nine or so when Maradona's been at Napoli for four or five years and he wants to leave and he he is he is starting to understand the the control that he is under by um, the crime family I think yes that's, that seems to be the kind of suggestion and he wants to, he it's when they've won the UEFA Cup and he wants to go and and the president says I'll do anything to keep him here at any yeah. cost I'm his jailer. That's right. He says, I became his jailer. It's a moment where Maradona, you understand he's being used by two different That's right. Organizations. And, and I think it's a metaphor. You, you know how there are books that have titles like something, How to Understand Life Through Football. Yeah, that mm. kind of, you know, football is seen as a metaphor for life. You know, if you work hard and you practice, you get better. You know, then kind of, you're not just an individual. You're part of a larger whole. You're part of a team. Yeah. Yeah, blah, 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 kind of, you know, the thing is used as a metaphor for life and how to have a good life. But actually, what it's never used for is also as a metaphor for capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that you're just a body that's used up and take all the juice taken out for somebody else's benefit. You know, you're just kind of a labor or a gift for someone else to extract and kind of make money off. And once kind of you're done, you're useless to them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, kind of the film shows that aspect of you know, kind of capitalism at work through kind of the figure of this individual kind of, you know, who's, who's, who has a use value, right? Mm -hmm. And who has a sales value and who has a symbolic value, but kind of, you know, how they just use it up and throw him away as soon as, you know, that's used up, as soon as they have no use for him or as soon as they can use him differently, right? To play a game of national politics rather than a game on the pitch. He's mm. used up and thrown away and destroyed because the film also shows how really he is literally destroyed. Yeah? So that kind of, you know, when, when he chooses over Argentina, over Italy, which is so unreasonable, which person would not choose their own country? Yeah. Right. Like it's completely unreasonable. But him having made that choice means, you know, that then kind of the judiciary is after him. He's entrapped in terms of drugs, you know, kind of. The mob gets rid of him, you know, and the whole kind of government is out to get him through taxes and whatever in a way that they hadn't cared before. Yeah, there's a, there's a kind know, of there's him, a hounding. Take, there's a taking the opportunity to get him for drugs and to give him a significant ban, the kind of ban that hasn't been seen before, to punish him for beating Italy in the semi final in the 90 World Cup. To punish In Italy to and punish, in Napoli. To punish him for the choice he made that you can't imagine anyone else making a different choice. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 yeah, exactly. so, it's, it's extraordinarily unfair. So there the film also... to me is great because it shows, you know, those, those contradictions. It's, I think it's a very complex film, really. You know, it's, uh, and I love Maradona, whom, you know, I didn't really have a view, much of a view on before, right? Like, you know. His reputation I'm, in this country is not great. And actually, but it's very interesting because I think you sh you know the film humbles English television viewers. Oh, I agree. You know because actually that moment, which is so important in the national psyche here about football, is just a tiny little element of Maradona's career, right? Like in the film, that's not that important. In the it's, film, is not that important. I do it's think given it, a minute. <laughs> I, do, I do think it was a little more important 
actually eat two Argentinians than the film portrays it as, but it, it but it wouldn't it it would slightly privilege. I think it's interesting because I've seen entire Sky television oh, yeah. documentaries on that moment, yeah, right? Yeah. And here it's like a minute. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's obviously a much greater context, but it, that was a huge moment. I mean, because the England Argentina football rivalry is significant, and obviously it it comes particularly from the fallout of the Falklands War in 1982. Yeah, yeah. And it's a it's a real intercontinental rivalry. I don't think there really is another one in world football. And for Argentinians, it's kind of Brazil, Uruguay, and England are the big rivalries. Mm. For us, we probably consider Argentina second to Germany, which is nuts because actually Germany don't care about us at all. Mm. <laughs> you know, for, I think for them it's Holland. But but the but England Argentina, even there was a friendly in about two thousand and six or something between England and Argentina that was crazy and like mm. there was a last minute winner and and you thought this is a this is a friendly you know so it they're big big games and that that match in 1986 where you know in the space of three or four minutes Maradona scored the most evil cruel cheating bastard dirty goal ever and then scored the greatest in World Cup history you know the film does say like this is the sort of this is the the one match that sums up Maradona no, no, no. there's yeah. this side and that side yes and um, I I love him because, you know, one of the things that the film makes so um, vivid is his humanity, right? So, you know, on the one hand, you know, the fact that he's like a, not just a working class kid, he's like dirt poor, like mm. barely subsistence kind of... From the slums in Argentina. From the slums, yeah. Series. But like sub, sub, sub working class. Mm. Um you know, that he's been supporting his whole family since the age of 15. There's a lot made of, of race in the film, though, frankly, I don't see him as being any darker, you know, than kind of most Argentinians I know. But, you know, kind of, you know, the film keeps referring to him as black. Um, so, um, and then his wife and well, or his two girlfriends talk about, you know, how tender he is, yeah, you know, and how loving he is and so on. So, um, you know, and how he loves to dance and like kind of like they, you know, there's a way in that they humanize him. And actually all of the footage that you see is him being really quite human, even in his worst moments. So, you know, for example, you know, the fact that he lies about having a child, right? Like you think that's despicable. Mm. And on the other hand, you think, oh, I might have done that also, you know, <laughs> okay. confronted, confronted with the same choice. I mean, it's a human choice. Mm. It's a human weakness. Right, like you recognize it as he's not special about having lied in that context about something like that. I think most men would have, actually. So, you know, he's not like this god or this saint. He is really kind of, you know, a flawed, weak person like everybody else, really. You know, so I love that that element of him, really. You know, and the fact that when you see him with his teammates and so on, he's so eager to please and to be part. And he's so generous with his praise, giving everybody else credit, you know, for things that are attributed mm. to him. You know, and then I love the bit at the end where he's being interviewed and he cries about his life. Right. Like and yeah. he's got no qualms about it. It's like it's almost like it's raw emotion that you have access to, you know. Yeah, there's a kind of culmination going on in that moment, which is an interview from 2000 and four I think yeah he's 44 um and he it, the film has made a jump of about 13 years because last time we saw him was leave, him leaving Napoli in 1991 in very quiet in a very quiet way basically just it's kind of escaping mm. um so the film jumps right ahead to this and he's put on a lot of weight and he's you know he's kind of stuffed into this shirt that's not big enough for his neck and he mm. he, he he looks in bad shape I mean people are kind of uh, he's looked like that for a while you know um but and he but looks it's in terrible shape. Yeah, like you know, I mean, there, and there's, <laughs> but there's, it, it is this kind of moment of culmination of everything that you've seen from basically 1960 to 1991 is kind of has kind of created this version of him now. There's this feeling of you know, kind of that he like he's a man who is living his own history. Yes, in a way, I identified with him completely. <laughs> you know, because. He's he's actually and there's something physically about him that you know it kind of it almost it rings my heart and maybe it's a kind of identification right because he's really short and stocky and he's not even very good looking or anything right so 
you know, kind of whenever you see him in group shots of some football celebration, he's always like the shortest, squattest mm. guy there. I mean, there's nothing about his physique, you know, that's imposing. You know, like he doesn't have long legs, he doesn't have big shoulders, yeah. he's not tall, right? Like, you know, so it's almost like sheer talent, really, that kind of propels mm. him kind of forward, right? The footage that it shows of him playing in the early 80s at, at um, Boca Juniors, mm. the guy moves unbelievably. He's smooth and he's fast and he has insane ball control. And I think yeah, if you didn't know anything about football, you would kind of get why why he was a sensation. Yes. You know, he was, he's a, he was he's a super naturally now. connected to the ball. I mean, watching that footage, it is extraordinary. It's extraordinary and it's such a pleasure to see yeah. it. And um, and it continues, you know, I, I, even as the film goes on uh, into his time at Napoli, it's, it's still just as pleasurable to watch. And then... A little bit later, when um, you know he's kind of getting to his late twenties and early thirties, and he's starting to put on some weight, yes. and he's starting to go through kind of rough times and, and get into drugs, and he's um, he's in the kind of depths of a cocaine addiction towards the end. He's still he's still captivating to look at on the pitch. Yes, you know it's kind of amazing. It's I, I it's sensational to watch just play football. I love him really because I mean he does all these terrible things. And in a way, he's so weak, right? And yet, you know, I mean, one of the things that the, these rise and fall um, stories, you know, they always fascinate me, is um, I remember David Foster Wallace talking about him having been either state champion or close to state champion, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's this article that he wrote on Federer, I think. Yes, yeah, another one. You know, and basically he says... You have to be a freak to be playing at that level, right? Because it means that you're training all the time, that you think about nothing else, you know, that there's like this discipline imposed, right, of like training and, yeah, and mm-hmm. concentration. I mean, so there's, you know, we have stereotypes of football players, which is basically they train for half an hour in the morning and then like, mm-hmm. you know, they just watch like videos <laughs> like for the rest of the day, right, and play two matches a week. But actually, I think to be a world-class athlete and to be playing at that level, the focus has to be enormous. And basically, his sister says, you know, basically, he gave up his life after the age of 15, like from the age of 15 onwards, Mm -hmm. right? Like, kind of, you know, his life was not his, is what she's saying, yeah? It was all kind of sacrifice. So kind of, you know, what you see see in the film is the drugs and the parting and so on. And actually, what you don't see is kind of, you know, what must have been a relentless training, yeah, mm-hmm. to be able to kind of play at that at that level. And I think he makes it all feel really human and messy, right, in the way that these films normally aren't. Like, you know, kind of there's nothing clear cut. It's almost, it's all like conflicting emotions that's kind of spill out, you know, with a great deal of love and regret, you know, which I think is kind of, you know, mm. when people re- reach a certain age, you know, there's probably kind of quite a lot of that, right? Like, you know, it's kind yeah. of... There's a lot of failure in everybody's lives and a lot of sadness and a lot of disappointment. And, you know, he kind of embodies that, right? And he kind of suffers for it, you know. Mm. Yeah, like a saint. A little bit, you know. I mean, I mean, the imagery, I was really struck. Because, as you know, I am kind of like a football lover, but I'm not a football fanatic, right? And actually, some of the things in the film, to me, were just like, gobsmacking you know so for example you know I always thought that like the English kind of were rather terrible you know in the terraces but nothing compared to the Italians right like you know I hope you all get tuberculosis in cholera right like (laughs) you know it's like I mean it's disgusting uh what they what they say and what they chant and they're chanting it you know like a you know, uh, within Italy to other Italians is kind of absolutely kind of gobsmackingly part, shocking. Part, part of it is that Napoli or Naples is seen as, or, or Neapolitans are seen as not Italian. You know, at one point they're talking about that they're the Africans of Italy. They're I know, the but... non-persons. That, um, I know, I yeah. but within Italy that would be like, for example, a way for Londoners to talk about about Manchester or something, right? Like, yeah. you don't get that level of, like, hatred, no. right? Well, and, to be fair, you do still get fans, and it's disgusting, you do still get fans singing about the Munich air crash, air disaster, that um, right. kind of ended Manchester United team, I can't remember the year, the 1960s, 
um, you do still get fans chanting about that every now and again, which is horrible. But that is kind of as far as sort of <laughs> gross, sort of personal, act, like really properly offensive club-wide attacks. That's kind of it yeah. uh, in this country. Um, you know, English football has, has had a horrible history with hooliganism, with violence. And it was ki- basically every English club was kicked out of Europe in the 1980s because of it. Um, wow. uh, but kind of, it's come a long way. You see, you see it in, uh, you still see it a great deal in Italy and in Russia. Well, maybe it's my ignorance. I have not seen anything like what we get to see in this film. Mm. You know, of how the Napoli team is treated as it goes through Italy. Yeah. I mean, it is really kind of. It's so shocking that I laughed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's so unbelievable that it's funny. Um, so, and within that, you know, the way that, you know, Maradona is pictured, like, you know, as a saint, as a god, as like, you know, and then how quickly, the fall from grace, how quickly it is. Mm. You know, once you are no longer the vehicle for my dreams, you are shit, right? That's kind of what the film is doing. And, and in that sense... I think it's a really kind of fascinating kind of vehicle through which to explore ideas around capitalism. You know, there, there is there is a kind of continuing uh, theme of of Maradona as God or as a God, or as and a also saint it's a, it's a it's a very very um, uh, Catholic country, believe it yes. or not, Italy, <laughs> and um, and he's kind of pictured. He's, he's like he's drawn into sort of murals of saints and things like that and everyone has a picture of Maradona in his house in the way that they would also you know they put it next to the picture of Jesus um, and people talk about him as uh, there's, there's one point where an interviewer I think says uh, you are you are you are a god essentially and he says no 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 I think so he's just kind of humble about it and then right at the end of the film when you jump forward to 2004 and he's walking towards the studio to be interviewed and he's in that you know, terrible shape as you say um uh, someone says you, uh, you're bigger than the Pope and he says that doesn't mean very much yes that sounds saying very you know, much the Pope is not so great <laughs> so you know, th- that's, that changes quite significantly yes um, I must say I really love this film I think it's really it's a really complex and interesting film uh, that not only kind of explores ideas around you know who is Ma- Maradona and the rise and fall of a famous iconic star, you know, uh, who marked an era in football. But actually, I think it goes beyond that, right? Mm-hmm. It kind of, you know, it, it, it teaches you something about the north-south divide in Italy, you know, about kind of ancient grudges between kind of different counties, around kind of iconicity, you know, um, and the way that kind of symbols are used to mobilize emotions by the by the mob in both senses the mob as in the mafia but the mob also as in like this amalgamation of people you know who kind of lose their reason basically you know you see that and it has fantastic footage of you know all shots from within the stadiums and you know it's very frightening to see all those smoke bombs kind of going off and you know mm-hmm. and people on the pitch and you know kind of the reaction on the terraces i mean to see it from their point of view, you you know, I, there's this shot where Maradona's going in with his child, and you think, why would you bring your child into this war zone, <laughs> right? Like, cause yeah. that's what it feels like, right? Yeah. Uh, so, I, uh, yeah, I loved it. Well, that's good, you yeah. know. I like it more having talked about it. I, it's funny, um, I really enjoyed lots of parts of it. I really enjoyed watching him play football. I really enjoyed this kind of his early story and that sort of thing. And then there would, there would, there would just be sections and it was all and it was always the sections where it was his, it was his family and and his um uh uh is cheating on his girlfriend or yes. wife and having a kid with uh, a neapolitan local who he, uh, which he denied for years and years, yes. and years those moments made me feel like i did in amy again going, I why can't we mind our business you're too judgmental i think that's a thing i don't you. think i am I why can't we are. mind our business well i just think you're... And that was the problem with Amy because this film is about people kind of not minding their business to a certain extent with the media and stuff. A- but Amy was all about that and the film was indulging. It was playing the game that it was decrying at the same time and that's what I hated. Well... Yeah, it was the... It was just saying, here's more of her. Like, you, what, you're, what you're doing, I think, is kind of... Um, 
mistaking categories because the thing is that these people are not just people they're also symbols they're stars they signify and also battles have been fought over what they mean in public for years right so i think it's very difficult not to deal with those things i don't think it's a case of dealing with them or not i don't have an issue with that my issue is that is that in telling the story I, again I'm, I'm talking about amy again i'm not talking about maradona here in telling the story the way they did in amy they were playing exactly the same game they were indulging they were giving you you know it was all oh here's footage you've never seen before here's her private home footage there was a point in it where she's in rehab um, and it, she's it, there's a lot of home footage in it, and it's home I footage that's that. been filmed by her boyfriend. Yeah. And he what he's trying to get her to sing rehab, which is her hit, and kind of change the words because it's all about you know the song is I said no 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 he wants her to oh go on do a little playful version change the words and she's not really into it, and you can tell she's not, and he says um, he says uh, it's just for our personal private film, and and I'm like well it's not now is it. No, everyone but, can see it. But and I you see, I, think, of, I found that out of order. I, I did not. Like well, but you see, that. I think that's part of what the film, that film, and the Maradona film are doing. You know that kind of like these people are absolutely raped. You know by everybody, um, and actually, what's kind of most disconcerting is that you know they're often violated by the people closest to them, and you know exploited by their family, by their boyfriends, by. Like, everybody wants something. How did the filmmakers get hold of that footage? They bought it. It was given to them. They had it. They are part they of it. Bu- That's what I had the problem with. They are part of it. And what's really disturbing is it took me five or six pages of looking through Rotten Tomatoes you know, reviews to find one that said that. Oh. Everyone said, this is fantastic. And the only there were like two or three negative reviews that said, like, it doesn't really explain why she did self-destructed. Yeah, I didn't feel it. But, the, but it took such a long time until I saw someone else say... This is wrong. Well, I don't think it's wrong. Um, I, I don't. Uh, I don't think the film... Um, I don't think the film exploits her in, in the sense that she's dead, you know. But what you see very clearly is how even those who are closest to her, you know, are exploiting to her. Are exploiting her. I, I noticed that very much with the boyfriend and the father. Yeah. Right? And so... And I like that. Because I think the film shows how how complex things are, how there's often mixed motives, how nothing is clear, right? How, you know, when you're drawn to that level of fame and money and so on, even a father who clearly loves his daughter is basically like pushing her to do things, mm. you know, so that the money can come in. Yeah, there's that point in the film where she's trying to get away. She's on a, she goes to an island or something and she takes her dad with her who's been kind of supportive since Mm. she's reconnected with him, but he brings along a camera crew and sound guy and stuff and is trying to get her to be part of some little film he's making. Yeah. And that's the point that he's using her. There is no peace, no escape, even from her family. It's awful. It's horrible. And I completely agree. And I think all those points are are well made, except that the film itself is doing it too. (laughs) Well, okay, well, we can... I mean, there's questions about the time and so on. She's already dead by the time the film is made. You know, so I think it's an exploration of an image, Mm -hmm. you know, and a person who's no longer alive, whereas actually all the things that are pictured in the film happened when she was alive, and it was actually the people who loved her that were doing it. That's, to me, what makes the film so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think that this is different. Yeah, it is. You know, um, he is alive, and I loved... I don't know what it says about me. I really love to see him suffer. <laughs> you know, I did. Well, you're I, a Catholic too. I know, and I identified with him. You know, I think life is difficult. And you think, like, you know, if you were, like, an international superstar, you know, and 25, I mean, and you had all these pressures on you and everybody wanted something, you know, would you have been able to resist the lure of cocaine? I mean, you know, I've, I've done it, and, you know, it makes you feel good. You know, and I could just, under- I completely understood it. And I, I, now I also understood, like, his remorse and his regret and, you know, how he wished he treated people better, right? Like, because the thing about Maradona is you really feel at every moment that his heart is in the right place and that he is a loving, generous person, mm. right? And then kind of, you know, his celebrity and, you know, the way that he's made an icon and other people put him in a, in a position where kind of, 
you know, certain things become impossible. You know, the saddest thing for me was his, and what I wanted to know more about was the ending shot because you, you know, so finally at the end of the film, he recognizes this son who he disavowed initially. 30 years later. he. Yeah, yeah. but, but also do you think, did he always disavow him? Did he never pay child support? You know, did he have a relationship with him in secret whilst in public he didn't recognize? I mean, or or did he completely ignore? Because he does say at a certain point in the film, something like, for the first three years, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with him and I didn't care. Mm. You know, but then that kind of suggests that... In between there may have been something else. Yeah, between the age of three and 30. Yeah. You know, there must have been something, or you hope there was something, mm. right? Um, so... Um, yeah, I, I I like that the film deals with messiness, yeah, with things that are not nice. Do you think there's a hagiographical uh, aspect to the film? No, not at all. Okay. And the reason why is because of what I'm saying, that it shows him being so weak, you know, and selfish and greedy and... But you're, but you're saying you find it very sympathetic. I do. You know? And kind of understandable, and he's not a villain really at all. Even though, I mean, well, I, I would kind of suggest that he is. And to me, certainly with cheating on his um, girlfriend, and it's kind of it's kind of explained as he's doing it all the time. And she was very naive and just accepted that his well, his lies. This is why I think that is that, that is something that is. That's where I think you're moralistic because you know, I mean, I can not only see, you know, I I think I'm a very truthful person, mm. you know. Um, but I have found myself in kind of situations where you don't always tell the truth, where you fudge it, where you have several things going on at once. And, you know, I kind of, and that's not a, that's a terrible trait, you know, and kind of, you know, you're right to condemn it or whatever. But, you know, so the reason why the film is not a hagiography is because you see all of these things about Maradona. Mm. You see him like super fat and ugly. You know, you see him crying. You see him with the drug taking and the whores. And it's not shown to say, oh, wow, what an exciting dynamic life, you know, this handsome guy had. He's not like Mr. James Bond playboy, right? This is all seen as a slide into seeminess and disgustingness and, you know, out of controlness, right? I mean, because actually nothing that you see in this film is any different than what you see in a Bond film. But in a Bond film, it's super cool. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. No, I agree. It's... it's, um... But then maybe that's like a, a long term sort of thing. It's like this is the this is the stuffing that he has to go through to become Saint Diego. <laughs> no, but the thing is, his son uh, Diego, at the age of twenty five, after he wins the the you know the national title with Naples, he is San Diego, yeah. right? And he is God. So actually, what you see then is like, you know, it's. Well, I mean, Saint Diego, like to us now, with the benefit of hindsight, you know. Like I said, he's now San Diego because of what he's been through and he's come out of it. And that's what the film... What I like about of, him, what I admire about him... He comes out of the him. film ultimately with a positive sort of outcome. Well, he, be, he comes out as very lovable the way that an old drunken uncle of yours <laughs> would be, but without the glory. Yeah, the kind of, you know... The, the, the thing about him is that he, he renders himself emotionally accessible at all times. He's a man who's in tune with his desires and his feelings... And you get the whole gamut of him, of them. Mm. From he loves his mom and dad, you know, he supports all his siblings, he feels guilty, you know, he, he, he's obviously involved with his childhood girlfriend, but then he can't resist the lure of this sexy blonde in Italy, right? Like, you know, there's that poster of that glamorous woman where he, like, kisses her, you know. He kisses her face. But oh. her tits and pussy are out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he kisses his hand and then touches his yeah, hand. To I her mean, face. Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of, it's not acceptable, but it's so understandable. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of, you can imagine anybody else doing it, really. You know, so I, I love that about, about the film. It's interesting how the film um, kind of shows him achieving such great things. He, he wins a title with Napoli, who the previous season had just escaped relegation. This is not a big team. This is not, he wasn't joining Internazionale. Yeah, he wasn't joining Milan. It's all about him. Um, yeah. yeah, he was the guy who brought them this title and then four years later he brings them another one. And that's huge. Um, and then, you know, he, he's the one who beats England. He's the one who wins the World Cup. And 
despite the fact that he he has these extraordinary achievements, um, I, I don't think it's the film's fault. I think it's it's kind of interesting though how they are made to seem small mm. or forgettable. Like you forget them almost immediately because his life moves quickly and there's and there's there's more problems for him. Mm. You know, it's kind of interesting. Like th- there's a point in it where when he's won the second title with Napoli or is it when he's won the UEFA Cup he says this is the biggest title of my career it's the biggest celebration and then he's asked what about the World Cup and he says something like um, do, do, you remember, do you remember that bit? I do remember he says, that he, he says uh, it's like it, it, he says at one point Napoli is my home he says it's as, yeah. though, it's as though he kind of no longer thinks of Argentina as his home I can't remember exactly what he says but it's interesting that you would think that the World Cup especially back then before European no, competition what which he is as says, big as it is now is would be what, the biggest thing. No, what he says is that um, he can't feel the same way about winning the World Cup because actually it was rejected by Argentina and he wasn't selected for the nineteen seventy eight team. That's right. The nineteen seventy eight World Cup was taken away from me and I wasn't able to win it with the team. Yeah. Which they did win, but he wasn't part of the team. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So Whereas Napoli said Napoli is my home and I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. And then but then that kind of leads into him saying prior to the Argentina Italy match in the ninety World Cup, which is played at Napoli Stadium. Yes. He says in the press, um I I would like it if the Napoli fans would support Argentina. Yeah. You know, which kind of feeds into that. So so, you know, then it leads into um Argentina winning the game on penalties and him being kind of uh, kind of uh, yeah Persona non grata. Well, in I Italy. think, and but I there's think... an interesting thing that it, he it's it's also suggests that he kind of stoked tensions. Well, you know, and I there mean, is that tension that we were talking about about Napoli being kind of non-Italian. Did he stoke that? Did he pick up on that? Because no, then the no, fans that, that, that pre-existed him. Um, no, but the point. Did he stoke that? That's the point. Did well, he, you know, wasn't, no, I don't think he stoked it. I think he believed it. Yeah, I think that was presented to him, and he believed it. And actually, one of the things that the film shows is. That if you're a stranger and an immigrant, you're always a stranger and an immigrant, and as soon as they have no use for you, they boot you out. That's what the film shows, right? So kind of Argentina ends up being home in spite of, you know, his feelings at the beginning because, you know, he was not chosen for the Argentine team in, the, in 1978. So he arrives in Napoli and, you know, he wins everything and people love him and worship him and whatever. And, you know, so he thinks, oh, well, you know, I'm now a Napolitan. And then the first wrong move and it's like, get out of here, you nigger stranger. <laughs> right. Like, that's basically what it amounts to. Yeah. You know, so I think that the film is really wonderful in that and in that, in showing that in, in in demonstrating that. But there is a feeling when it gets to that point and, and he's ultimately leaving Napoli, there's a feeling of kind of, OK, the adventure's over. It's time to go home. Yeah. You know, well, he leaves home immediately overnight. I mean, yeah. he knows that. Right. It's been told him that, you know, he's been persecuted and as soon as he tests positive, he th- he knows it's all over and he packs up overnight and leaves, mm. right? That's kind of, I think, fascinating. Um, before we want to wrap up, I want to ask a kind of a theoretical question, which had occurred to me while watching the film, which is, what is directing or the job of a director in a film which is almost entirely found footage. I mean, you know, is the director of this film not the editor? What does a director do in a film that is almost entirely found footage? I can't, I don't well, know. I, I, I suppose it's about marshalling, I suppose it's about working out from the, you know, kind of, I would see mass of of kind of footage and interview and so on at, at his disposal, what are the themes you want to draw out? What's the story you want to tell? Just because you don't do it with shots but is that, that you create not yourself. done by the editor? Well, I, th- I, so I, I suppose it's a joint sort of... I mean, I imagine... like there's not, uh, The editor will have the director sitting over his shoulder when he's... I know, I know, I know, I know that. Like, I know that. Um, you know, so it might be a collaborative thing. Yeah. But actually, this is a very beautifully edited film, I think. I imagine yeah. it is all. It, it is all collaborative. I mean... That's that is what filmmaking is. Very very seldom do you get like a Steven Soderbergh who's like, I'll do it all myself, and I'll just give myself loads of pseudonyms. No, I know, but you can yeah. imagine in a narrative film of, or or even a documentary of a different kind. You know, you can say the director will say, put the camera here, put the light mm. there. I want this rhythm. I want to get this effect or whatever. But I think almost all of the effects in this film are actually obtained through editing and structure. You know, so mm. I. 
I'm just yeah. asking the question because I don't know the answer to it. I Nor think it's an I. interesting question. I'm not a filmmaker either. Maybe we should ask someone who is. Maybe well, we, we, should, we, maybe we should email Asif Kapadia and say, what did you do? Yes. <laughs> did you do anything at all? <laughs> you know, oh, were you just there bossing the editor? <laughs> yeah. Well, one would assume that he conducted the interviews as well that, that formed part of it. And, um, Except yeah. I thought, so, you know, you were saying how the film is narrated. I don't think it is narrated. I mean, I think there are interviews with the trainer. No, no, I didn't say it's narrated, but there, there are points in which interviews are brought in. Yeah, but that's no, but I think it's a wonderful film, partly because it's not narrated. There isn't a voiceover narration. Yes, yeah. You know, um, so kind of meaning is constructed through the footage, through bits of dialogue, sound, music, yeah, structure. Yeah. You know, there isn't a voice of God telling you what to think about what you're seeing. You know? No, it's people people telling the story when they are brought in. Yeah. Um, and when they are, it's not overbearing or anything like that. They are, their, their points of view and what they say work really smoothly in tandem with the footage and with what is said by people. Because you know, a lot of the footage is of interviews and stuff themselves mm. from, from the time. Um, so, I mean, I think it is, in that respect, in, a, in just kind of a, a technical sense, it is brilliantly made. Yes, I think it's brilliant. Um, as as um, was Amy and Senna, as yes. were Amy and Senna, they, they flow really, really naturally and organically. Mm. Um, and I think tell their stories kind of really well. Uh, in that sense, so I, th- I mean that's kind of that's a huge achievement actually because mm. that can't be easy. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm afraid to seem so effortless, you know. Um, there are two great documentaries that are out at the moment. I think this is one of them. I think it's a truly great film. Uh, the other one is Amazing Grace, uh, which is also doing the rounds, and which um, you know I thought was sublime. Uh, so if you love documentaries and you love cinema, you know, go see Maradona and go see Amazing Grace. I don't, I don't love documentaries, so I'm, I won't see Amazing Grace. <laughs> <laughs> you probably, yeah. It's a, it's an interesting thing about Aretha Franklin, you know, because yeah. I, I broke up with a boyfriend because he didn't like Aretha Franklin. I thought, well, if you can't, if you don't <laughs> like Aretha Franklin, you can't understand me. You know, really? Like you, yeah, I'll never get to know you. Fuck off. <laughs> Did you not feel think, he respected you? No, I just think that there's something about Aretha, about like the way that she sings and pain, and you know, kind of the complexities of emotion, and just that huge talent, right? Like, you know, her voice soars and it just hits you in a particular way, and also she's very controlled in what her voice does, and I think if you can't understand that voice. And what the singer does with it, yeah. then I don't think you'll ever be able to understand me, you know. Wow. So yeah. Big no. words. That's true. I was the same way with S Club Seven. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't like Reach, if you don't know all the words to Reach, then you're out of my life. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we are eavesdropping at the movies and we are on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube to listen to us. And uh, on social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter at Eavesdrop Movies is the handle. And our website is eavesdropping at the movies.com. Yes, thank you very much for listening. Bye bye. <laughs>